Well, it didn't take long for the Cardinals to have a completely bizarre game in this 2024 season. It happened Saturday, and it happened in a Cardinal win. Let's talk about it coming up on b Shafe Daily. What's going on, everyone, and welcome in to this edition of B-Shape Daily. Brendan Schaefer here with you. It's the early morning hours of Sunday, March 31st, 2024. Happy Easter, everybody. What a ridiculous game the Cardinals had on Saturday night at Dodger Stadium. Cardinals win it 6-5 to five in 10 innings. The first extra inning game of the 2024 season goes the Cardinals' way. Six, five, and ten innings, a game that initially looked like the Cardinals would be in some deep trouble with the way Lance Lynn began in that first inning, loading the bases with nobody out. And then, of course, he gets out of that jam by striking out the side. Three strikeouts in a row. Great tweet from Jeff Jones uh, about what Lance Lynn said regarding that situation that we'll get to on tonight's episode of B-Shape Daily. And then it was a game that the Cardinals seemingly should have had uh, plenty of command of after Joe Kelly, sleeper agent, was activated in the seventh inning. What a ridiculous seventh inning. We'll talk about that. And then how the Cardinals nearly coughed this thing up, not the ninth inning that Ryan Helsley wanted to have. So we go to extras, and the Cardinals find a way there. How about Giovanni Gallegos? Nuts up and gets it done with uh, some strikeouts and then a pop-up of Shohei Otani. They're in the 10th inning. So all that coming up and more as we break down the Cardinals 6-5 win from Saturday night. This is B-Shafe Daily. I'm Brendan Schaefer. Make sure to hit that subscribe button in the lower right-hand corner of your screen if you enjoy Cardinals content on a regular basis throughout the baseball season. That's on YouTube, and you can also follow the podcast on Spotify. B-Shafe Daily, just click the follow button. I always get updated when uh, I get new followers on the Spotify side, so I appreciate you guys for doing that. And you can also subscribe on Apple Podcast if you're so inclined. Let's go ahead, though, and get right into the meat of it today as Lance Lynn making his re-Cardinal debut. As it's been a number of years since he's been in the birds on the bat, but Lance Lynn was back tonight and the same as ever. It's like he never left. I was taken back to, you know, whatever, 2016, 2017, 18, whenever it was that he last pitched for the Cardinals and sort of remembering what it's like to, to watch a Lance Lynn game. Obviously, we watched him in spring training. Didn't pitch a ton in spring. But just, it's just like it never, it's the same, exact same. Like it's like he was never even gone is sort of the way that it felt. And at times, that was a little bit frustrating. I'll tell you, the first couple of innings, I think he totaled like 55 pitches. Lance Lynn has a tendency at times when he's not just like picture perfect sharp to waste a ton of pitches and It can be kind of grueling to watch him try and navigate that when that's going on. I feel like that's where things were in the first couple of innings. Great tweet, though, from Jeff Jones, which was only great because of the great quote by Lance Lynn as uh, Jeff out there covering the Cardinals for the Belleville News Democrat on this uh, West Coast swing. Let me find the tweet. Lance Lynn was asked about getting out of the bases loaded jam, striking out the side thereafter. I won't. I think I could on YouTube. I'd have to put a content warning on it if I say what Lance Lynn said. But Lance Lynn, on his, on his adjustment in the first inning, quote, they're already loaded, so F it. Let it rip. But Lance Lynn uh, does not censor himself, as we know at this point. So that's kind of a fun vibe. I mean, maybe this Cardinals season is going to be different after all if we're getting if we're getting those sorts of Lance Lynn quotes on day three. Maybe not so bad. Maybe this isn't 2023 all over again. Uh, because I know that there was not a fellow in the rotation who would have talked like that last year. <laughs> Maybe Miles Michaelis would. Um, I don't. Th- I don't think Lance Lynn got that line from number fifty, though. Let's just say. But Lance Lynn does. He strikes out the side. He comes back to get him. And this is after the Cardinals offensively struck out or were struck out as a side by Yoshinobu Yamamoto in the first inning. Brendan Donovan was looking at a strike. It happened a couple of times on strike three for him. He eventually becomes part of the heroics for the Cardinals, of course, though, capping the seventh inning with a big-time swing that allowed it to turn into a five-run seventh for St. Louis. Very important that it did so, as we found out in the later innings. But, man, there for a while, Brendan Donovan, one of the guys I wanted to talk about. Now, he's hitting 083 for the season. We're only three games into this thing, so nobody's freaking out. But the number of strikeouts looking, I think he had one prior to today as well, at least one. And then I I believe both of his strikeouts today were looking, and I just am not sure at times what he's looking for. 
Um, but he ended up finding it later on in the game. So maybe that was a sign of things to come for Brendan Donovan, who had the two-run double. I believe it was a double there late in the seventh inning as the Cardinals were getting things going and piling on in uh, a number of runs that were charged to Joe Kelly, who maybe it was a sleeper cell situation for the former Cardinal reliever, um, only was credited with two-thirds of an innings pitched, uh, of an inning pitched, pardon me, five runs, four earned, three hits, a walk for Joe Kelly, one blown save as well as his ERA balloons to 21.60. But let's get over what happened first with Lance Lynn, who did settle in after his first couple of innings where he threw, I, th- I think it was 55 pitches, something like 31 strikes and 24 balls, um, something to that effect. And then he started to settle in and have some quicker innings in innings three and four. And that allowed him to fit. And that was it. That's all he threw, 70 pitches. So, I mean, that seems almost impossible that he was 55 pitches after after two innings and then and then finished with 70. But I think that is what it was. I don't know if I have the exact ability right now to go back and double check that, but I remember looking after the second going, man, he is really using up a lot of his, uh, a lot of his pitch count. And it's like sometimes man, when he, and again, I think he was sharp enough, obviously was able to, to get the five strikeouts that he had in the four innings pitched, uh, four hits allowed one walk allowed no runs, which is a, a key stat here. And Lance Lynn would have gone deeper into this game, obviously, but you had the rain delay pop in when it did, which I, I, kind of reviewed that in a separate video already on the channel if you want to go check that out uh I don't know what the the Dodgers stadium grounds crew was was trying to do to that tart but I don't think they did it right as it took a while to unfold and then to get it flattened out on the field and Ollie Marmel seemed upset about that I didn't see anything major post game from him regarding that situation uh that anybody has reported as of yet but the video showed him kind of getting a little bit upset in, in animated, at least in the way that he was talking to the umpires. Just a weird situation. The first rain delay at Dodger Stadium since April of 2015. And I'm telling you, it looked like it with the way that the ground screw tried to get the tarp going. And I think they honestly waited too long to put the tarp on in the first place. They had Lance Lynn pitching in a torrential downpour in the fourth, which gave us some great imagery of Lynn just kind of grinding through and looking cool coming off the field after doing it. Completely soaked jersey. There's a Nike vapor for you. I don't think any I don't think any kind of jersey was going to stay dry under those conditions. But it was. It was crazy with the the level of rain they were getting that it was that they were still playing. And then I think to to come out for the top of the fifth inning, it's like the grounds crew before just saying, Oh yeah, obviously we're gonna do the tarp now that we've got a clean inning break. Guess the umpires had not signaled for it. Maybe that's why Ollie was upset. But I think they were trying to put some drying agent out there, like in the middle of the downpour, and then I, I saw a tweet that Jason Hayward was yelling at the grounds crew or at the umpiring crew to, to you know, suspend the game and, and get the, the tarp on the field because otherwise you're maybe not going to be able to play the game later on if you can't get the field in good enough condition. And the field was in pretty crappy shape. Like the, the rain delay was like a half an hour, 40 minutes, something like that. But it ended up being, I guess, good enough to play on. It sure, it sure didn't look it with the, the standing water and the pools and puddles of water that were on the infield like in multiple spots, but whatever the case was, I don't think anybody had any like close calls on injury or anything. So um, it is what it is at that point, but yeah, just a weird situation. You knew coming into the day that there, there was supposed to be rain tonight in Los Angeles, kind of a rarity, obviously in Southern California, but it was raining on Saturday morning. And then everybody was saying, Oh no, they're going to play because that, you know, the, the, the rain's not going to come till later. And I'm thinking, well, later it's, at least in central time zone, you're talking about the game starting at eight, eight o'clock. And so out, out West, maybe they figured the six o'clock start time would be fine, but it wasn't, it was like an hour into the game. If that, um, maybe a little bit more that the rain started and, and it really, really picked up there for a while. So that was something that they had to deal with. And the grounds crew seemed ill prepared to do so. But what it meant is that Lance Lynn, although he was only at 70 pitches, I think the delay was just enough that for the Cardinals and you've already got one starter on the IL no reason to risk it. It was interesting to me that Yamamoto came back out for the Dodgers after the rain delay and pitched another, uh, I think just the one inning, but uh, he looked very good. By the way, I know that he's kind of been up and down in terms of people's opinions of him based on what happened in spring training. And then his first outing uh, in, in the Korea series, but five innings, two hits, no walks, five K's 
Uh, pretty good stuff from Yamamoto. Lowers the ERA. Still seven and a half. I think he's going to be okay. I think he's going to be a pretty good one. He had some some nasty offerings uh, to the Cardinals for sure. But I think the rain delay probably impacted both starters. Like Lance Lynn, the fact that he was able to pitch innings three and four and be as efficient as he was, I bet he would have gone six. I bet he would have been able to get through um, the fifth and sixth and, and put him at about 100 pitch count, if if not even a little bit less than that. But the rain delay made sure that that did not happen. And Matthew Libertor comes in, and that's where the first runs of the game are scored. He gives up a couple of runs in his first inning of work there in the fifth, and then he stays in for the sixth inning. But in the top of the seventh is when the Cardinals get those runs back and then some. Let's talk about Joe Kelly's sleeper cell, uh, activated for the Cardinals in a moment where they really needed it, guys. I mean, the Cardinals needed to win this game. I know there were multiple times late where you thought maybe they weren't going to, and we would be talking about a completely different vibe to this team, a team that was already sort of at risk of totally cratering just with the way it felt. Um, I don't know that they felt that way in the clubhouse. I know how the fan base has felt about it. In the clubhouse, they probably are are able to, having most of them done this for, for a long time, know that, look, you're playing a really good team. You lost a couple of games. It's it's just the beginning of a season. But I think the fans and many of the players on that team probably have this in the back of their head as well, connect it to the feeling of of what last season ended up being and and just desperately hoping to avoid something like that. So that's maybe going on in the back of your head. But the Cardinals really did need this game, and they were able to find it basically thanks to what happened in the seventh inning. I know they had to sort of kick it into another gear in the 10th after Helsley gave it up a little bit in the ninth inning, which we'll talk about. But how about the seventh inning where you just find all the various ways to get on base and have them happen all in one inning? I was watching the game on mute at this point, and I because my wife and I were, were watching our way through Only Murders in the Building, um, Hulu show with uh, Selena Gomez, Steve Martin, Martin Short. Pretty good. But we're watching that on the, our bottom TV. I insisted upon like mounting two TVs directly, one below the other, for this exact purpose, and uh, it's going pretty well. I got to be honest with you. But I had the the top television muted with the Cardinal game going on, and when this like not obstruction balk thing happened, I told my wife, "I'm like, I'm sorry, I have to switch the volume to that because Matt Carpenter is jogging home gleefully from third base, not a care in the world. Nobody's trying to tag him out." And it looks like they're sending Victor Scott back to the plate. I'm pretty sure I just saw him fly out to left field. So what in the hell is going on? It, but that wasn't even the beginning of it. That was like what happened later on. So Joe Kelly comes into the game in the seventh, replacing Daniel Hudson, who threw a scoreless sixth for the Dodgers. Nolan Gorman draws a walk. Arenado hit by a pitch on the shoulder, front shoulder, and hit the deck and came up with the the... I'm going to wreck Joe Kelly eyes kind of, it felt like there for a moment. Um, I think he was too on the ground to be charging the mound, but I, I don't know. I don't know what the pre- the prior relationship there, if there is one between Joe Kelly and Nolan Arenado, but that was one where a guy feels like uh, his, his livelihood is at, at risk a little bit there when it goes up, up near the dome, uh, got him on the front shoulder, but certainly not a very comfortable moment for a hitter. And Arenado was, kind of chilled there on the ground for a moment. I don't think he was necessarily injured, but startled for sure at how close that pitch came to uh, to the cranium. So he gets to first base by hit by pitch. Runners on first and second. And then, like, I think the first pitch to Matt Carpenter was the catcher's interference. I can go back and check on that. Yeah, it, foul ball catcher's interference, I think, is what it was ruled. The glove came flying off of Will Smith. And so just like that, the Cardinals don't have a hit in the inning but they've reached base in three different methods with the walk, the hit by pitch and the catcher interference. And now you're in a spot where it's like, Oh my goodness, if they could come through because it's just been that kind of series so far where you figure this could probably end up as like a ground ball, double play. So one run scores and then a strikeout to end the inning and you're down two to one. And that's probably the final, right? That's the way you'd feel with the way things had gone to that point for the Cardinals. But Yvonne Herrera, and he was pissed off about the result, man, but he got a sacrifice fly um, out there to deep left center field. He he almost got all of it, man. And if he had, it would have been something to to see a grand slam there for Yvonne Herrera. But uh, it wasn't meant to be. He was kind of letting out a rage scream as he was uh, walking back to the dugout or walking toward first base after the ball was caught. And by the way, if if you're an astute listener of the podcast, and an astute watcher of Cardinal baseball, you know, I transposed 
it wasn't left center field. It was right center field uh, for the right-handed batter, Ivan Herrera. I've got the, the, the mirror thing. I've got like a mirror dyslexia. It's a whole thing. Um, right center field is where <laughs> Herrera hit that ball. And it w- I, I remembered it because I was like, I knew it was to the opposite way and just didn't quite get enough of it when you're hitting it that direction. If that's a pulled ball, it probably is a home run, but was just a little bit behind on the pitch that was low and away. So he he hit it where it was pitched, but ends up turning into one run for the Cardinals. Avon Herrera is a guy we talked a lot about in spring. I think he can have a really nice year for the Cardinals, and that was good to see him have a moment uh, in his first opportunity. And we'll talk, too, about the fact that Herrera got to start tonight. Um, Brandon Crawford got the start tonight. Uh, Alec Burleson was out there in the field, had a nice uh, assist on a, on a throw in the, uh, back to the plate. I think that was what took place to end the inning that the, the Dodgers scored their couple of runs against Libertor. It was an inning that ended on an outfield assist by Alec Burleson, a nice throw to the plate. So good to see him kind of making a, a contribution there defensively. And he had a nice game offensively as well, had the base hit to right field that tied the game following the Yvonne Herrera at bat in the seventh. Brandon Crawford, adding on with a base hit into uh, the, the hole between first and second base. And so now you've got an opportunity still to rather than just be tied because you know that the Dodgers are going to come knocking for more runs. You've got to find a way to get a lead here. And that's when all hell broke loose. Matt Carpenter officially scored on a balk, but at first they told us it was obstruction. And again, I was just unmuting the television and, and furiously refreshing my Twitter timeline for anybody that had information on what we were seeing. What a weird situation. First of all, with Vic fly ball, to left field. I I wish the MLB as I'm kind of going through this.com would have the, the, the video of that play, because that's the one that I actually would like to rewatch a couple more times. Um, But I think we ultimately got the explanation because I saw a tweet from Katie Wu where she went back and watched the replay, I guess, and said that what had happened was Matt Carpenter must have heard the third base umpire call for the balk. And so that's the reason that he's not like tagging up and hauling ass home on the, the, the hit by Victor Scott to the left fielder, because when that ball was come, come flying in. And again, I'm watching on mute at this point. When I see the fly ball, the depth of it, I'm like, Oh, that's, I don't even care to know who is running at third base. It doesn't matter. They're scoring. There's just no way you're not tagging and at least trying to score. And if something crazy happens and you get, thrown out then we'll talk about that but you've got to be good it was a deep enough fly ball by Victor Scott to to go ahead and give it a go and try and take the lead in this game and then when they throw the ball in and I see Matt Carpenter like retreating to third base and still standing there I'm like what's going on and I think he momentarily got confused because he heard the balk call like what had to have happened and again had tip to Katie Wu because I think it was her tweet that sort of first uh, uh, alerted me to like okay I think that's probably what happened he hears the balk call Figures, I start walking home, but then Victor Scott hits a ball to deep left. And so he goes, well, maybe I don't, I I can't just start walking home. Let's just go ahead and let this thing sort itself out. But it ended up looking kind of weird. And as a result, I think that's why he wasn't running. He had already heard the umpire call for the balk, then got confused because the ball got hit, which I believe in the case of a balk, I could be wrong about this, but I think that the way that it plays out is like, if, if you get a result that you like as the offense, you can keep that result. I think that's right. If the pitch is, is you know, the, the balk is called late enough that the pitch is happening, I'm pretty sure you can just take that result. It, like if Victor Scott hits a grand slam there, that's just a grand slam. I think. Not 100% on that. I'm diving into the Google rabbit hole right now as I record the podcast because I it sounded right. It sounded like something that we had talked about before. And I believe... Well, now I know for sure that it was the case. My memory had served me correctly because it happened in September 2016 to the Cardinals. Colton Wong hit a home run after a balk call and it ended up, you know, being a home run. If a pitcher delivers the ball after he's called for a balk, the ball is still live. And then this article I'm reading from MLB until someone like Colton Wong makes it dead again. So I bet you didn't think you were getting a Colton Wong reference on today's podcast, but there it is. So because it ends up being a flyout, I, I bought continuation. That's the rule. But I, I guess because it didn't work out in the Cardinals' favor, and the, the certainly the base runner reacted differently as a result of it, that's what made it really interesting, too. And the fact that they weren't calling it a balk at first. They called it obstruction. And I was like, okay, obstruction, everybody gets a base. That's great. 
the batter doesn't go back into the box after obstruction unless I'm crazy. I still, like, I, I don't think that's, I don't believe that would be the case. And I'm not necessarily going to spend the time down that rabbit hole because I tried real quickly to Google that one and I came up empty on my first search and it's almost 2 a.m. So I'm giving up on that one. But because they called it obstruction at first, I think that made it even more confusing. It never was obstruction. I thought maybe M Max Muncy was just like screwing around and like heard the bot call. And so he like hugged Carpenter or something to like keep him from going just to like be goofy. And then that was why Carpenter still ended up at third base because I'm like, otherwise, what is your excuse? Like, how are you not, how are you not at least tagging up regardless of what the call ended up being? Well, he is the person who heard the call from the umpire's lips. And that's why he was a little bit confused when, when Victor Scott. And then at that point, you're like, okay, I'm not going to do anything damaging because worst comes to worst. I just get to walk home once everybody figures this thing out. Um, uh, you know, otherwise just be a good base runner. And maybe this is a result. If the, the fielder drops the ball, it ends up being a ball all the way to the wall. Like we can all score. Let's just kind of act natural. And I guess that's what happened there with Matt Carpenter, but that was how the Cardinals went ahead in the game three to two in the seventh inning. Victor Scott uh, had would have had a, a solid fly out to each outfielder, one to center, one to right, and then one to left, but ended up being, um, not the case because the one the left didn't end up counting. But my, my quick commentary on Victor Scott is I think he's going to be just fine. Um, I understand that he doesn't have the statistics that you're looking for. He's still lacking that first major league hit. But to me, he was putting good swings on the ball. I know the first couple of games he had piled up some strikeouts. Uh, looked pretty competitive to me today. Just didn't allow one of those hits to fall in. Uh, ended up popping out later on in that seventh inning. And I believe later on in the game recorded uh, another out because in the ninth inning, he struck out. So he did have one strikeout in the game, but it was nice that he ended up being the last out of the ninth inning because he ended up being the Manfred man as a result for the 10th inning. And I don't know that a lot of other guys are necessarily going to score on the play that Victor Scott scored on Donovan moved him over with a ground ball. And so he goes from second to third with one out and then Goldsmith left side grounder infield in, I think it was Mookie that picked it up from sort of the, the shortstop area and he thought for a moment to try and make a play at home, but then he wheeled and threw to first base to took, take the shore out. I, I think with anybody else running, Mookie Betts is probably going to try to cut that run down at the plate and then basically have the chance to get out of the inning still tied with the Dodgers game-winning run on, on second base when you begin the bottom of the 10th. Again, Victor Scott is making an impact. So even though you're still looking for that hit, I thought he did take some good at-bats tonight, and, and obviously his ability on the bases came through once again. Uh, find a way to make him the Manfred man, the the runner on second base every time you go into extra innings. It, it's pretty good. Um, worked out really well for the Cardinals in this case. But then it was Brendan Donovan who added the much-needed insurance, uh, the ground rule two-run double in the seventh inning to kind of cap things there for the five-run inning. Thank you, uh, Cardinals fans should say, to Joe Kelly uh, for just not really having his best night on the mound. And then Brendan Donovan really coming through with a swing that they would end up needing because Mookie Betts is still a thing. Cardinals gave up their third run in the seventh inning, bottom of the seventh inning, base hit by Will Smith, drives in Mookie, and then Mookie with a home run in the ninth inning against Ryan Helsley to really start to make things interesting. And that began to go off the rails, and it could have gone off the rails even further than it ultimately did. Helsley was getting peppered after that by a bunch of singles. He did strike out Otani, but Freeman, Will Smith, Max Muncy, all with base hits, and the third of which... Uh, plates that tying run, which brought us to the situation from the 10th inning that I kind of ran through there just a moment ago. And then the bottom of the 10th inning was crazy as well. A conversation with three lefties coming up. I believe it was Gallegos and Palante that were warming up. And I had to open my big Twitter finger mouth and say, I'm not so sure about Gallegos over Palante here because I'm thinking you got the one run lead. It's six to five um, Cardinals, by the way, almost were able to tack on even more in the 10th inning. Um, uh, right decision, I think, by Mookie Betts with Victor Scott running to not throw it home just to take the shore out because now the bases are empty. But the Cardinals began to fill them again and almost were able to come up with something they couldn't do it, which meant the Dodgers, really, there's, there's pressure, obviously, going into that situation for Los Angeles in the bottom of the 10th. But you've got that tying run already on second base. There's a lot of different ways to manufacture that run. And it was toward the bottom of the lineup that was up. Outman, Hayward, Lux, all lefties. We know that historically, Palante has good reverse splits. 
I still had the home run that Gallegos gave up earlier in the series in my head, and I thought this could be bad, especially if they turn it over to the top of the order, and you have Mookie Betts and Otani and Freeman potentially having their say on the outcome of this game against Gallegos, and if it gets that deep, I'm not sure it means that Gallegos was too sharp in the outing, but I got to give him credit. My tweet was dumb where I said I'd go, and you know, I'm not so sure I said maybe Palante instead of Gallegos. The, the, me and the slider was working really good for Giovanni Gallegos. Got Outman with it, got Hayward with it. I believe Hayward's was even a full strike, uh, what do you call it? <laughs> a full count, not a full strike count. It's 2 a.m., like I said, I apologize. But that slider just drops off the table for Gio when it's really, really working. And when he can put it in a position that, like, he doesn't have to use the slider, even on a lefty, it doesn't really have to be inside off the plate because I think that's where it's in the plane of vision almost where the batter can just recognize that it's going to not only duck below the strike zone, but inside as well. And you're just not as tempted to swing at a pitch like that. I think when it's sort of middle-middle, at least in their minds, it's going to be, but then it just falls off the table with more of a vertical break. That's just such an effective pitch for Gio. And when he's at his best, that's the one that he's able to do some damage with. And that was exactly the case there as he got things going in the 10th. That's a tough thing to do to have the man for man on second base. When you come into a game, Jojo Romero was a guy who was, was really good most of the time that he was in those situations last year. And uh, tonight you saw Gio really get started hot and then had the ground ball to Brandon Crawford, where we can bring up the notion of Mason Wynn not being in there as a defensive replacement. I saw a tweet from reporters. I think this was Jeff Jones as well, where Ollie Marmel had said after the game that he was looking to honor the off day for the guys that he had off, which was Wilson Contreras, Jordan Walker, and Mason Wynn. Uh, there were contingencies where some of those players were going to be used. I think Contreras would have ended up as a pinch hitter uh, if a certain spot came up in the order. They were talking about Mason Wynn, uh, pinch running for Matt Carpenter. If that situation ended up being necessitated, um, I, I, maybe there was really no no look where they were considering Jordan Walker. But it is kind of interesting that you're talking about the off day already when you're three games into a season. Um, I don't really agree with Ollie Marmel on that one. I just don't think it's super necessary with guys like Arenado and Goldie and, and Contreras too. As you get deeper into the season, I absolutely can understand that, but you're really trying to maximize your chance to win a game here. Um, but it works out like all he ends up saying, look, I'm not maybe going to set the precedent that Mason win always has to come in for Brandon Crawford on the, 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 the late game situations if it's close on days where Crawford starts, like maybe that's not something that they're going to do every time. I think it probably would be their, to their benefit to do it, but then you do end up with a Mason win playing 160 games, even if he's only starting 130, whatever the case might be there. Like, is that something that you worry about just overworking the 22 year old? Um, maybe, maybe not. I don't know. Let me know Cardinals fans in the comment section below what your thoughts were on Mason win, not being in that situation and then we didn't see any pinch hitter for Carpenter. Uh, he was the guy, I believe, that made the last out in the top of the 10th inning when the Cardinals really did have an opportunity there to potentially add on because you had a Gorman single, uh, Arenado. There's no... Now, wait a damn second. They called that an error on Max Muncy? That's crazy to me. I was just thinking that Arenado... I just am seeing this now. You heard my reaction live as I'm going through the game log here on MLB. I, Arenado in the tenth inning hit that rifle to third, and yeah, it went it went through Muncie, and it it went off as either his body or his glove or whatever. Like it, it definitely made contact with him, and sort of settled into uh, shallow left. But that was a rifle by Arenado. I can't believe they didn't give him a hit on that, unless I'm crazy. Like that one really, I, and I'm like, man, okay. I even tweeted like that's that's more of a Nolan swing. Like, Arenado's been looking, you know, a little bit suspect at the plate compared to what we're all used to seeing from him. And so I even made a mental note of that moment. And I was like, all right, that's that's Nolan Arenado kind of getting his mojo back. I'm I'm talking my way through this because I want to check out the, the, the stat cast on that because I'm super surprised to ultimately see that that was not ruled a hit for Arenado. 100.3 off the bat, it was just like a, a shot right at, that's crazy if you can hit a ball 100 miles per hour off the bat and not be given a not be given a base hit for that. 470 expected batting average. Well, I guess so. He hit it 100 miles an hour. Right down the left field, you know, would have been down the left field line. Muncie just happened to be 
close enough to get a glove on it, but whatever. I guess I guess it got too much of Muncie to not be considered an out. But you know, that's just all that is is a little bit of a bummer for Nolan's batting average. But it was I mean, he he made that happen. I'm surprised it's an error. I'm surprised it's an error. But nevertheless, like they don't pinch hit Matt Carpenter in that spot. He ends up striking out. Frustration on the strikeout to me is that the pitch he swings at for the strikeout is not nearly as hittable as the very first pitch of the at bat. I don't know why certain guys and I mean, Carpenter is a guy who works counts, but in that spot, you're like, I'm hunting to try and give insurance to my team would have maybe preferred to see him swing at that first pitch. I think it was like 84 right down the pipe. Um, Don't remember specifically the pitch type, but the location was certainly not what you'd be looking for if you are the, the guy on the mound there. So they don't pinch hit for him. What do you think about the fact that Ollie Marmel was trying to stick to the off day? I think kind of three days into the season and and you're 0-2 in the series and you, you're you probably pulling out all the stops. Not like managing like it's October because that's a little bit overkill, but I do think that in that case I would have had probably a pinch hitter for Carpenter. But all the, the other side of that is that Matt Carpenter has been taking some solid at-bats and I believe it was a righty on the mound, so it's not necessarily like you're gaining a platoon advantage by doing it. So I'm I'm a little bit okay with that one. I do think probably Mason win instead of Brandon Crawford at short. Not like you're trying to just, you know, neuter Brandon Crawford right away and say you're basically just just a, a warm body for when Mason Wynn's not going to play, and then he'll come in when he's ready to kind of take your spot and take over the real shortstop duties. Maybe that's the precedent they're looking to not set. But in that moment in the 10th inning, man, I do wonder if Mason Wynn would have been able to throw out the runner at first base on that ground ball to the left side. All he said after he didn't think it would have been that even if Mason was out there, like the the correct play was the conservative play to not try and chance it because of the angle. And it was like a sharp angle because he was, he was facing more toward third base and would have had to maybe throw across the body, do it quickly, wasn't hit sharply, and you potentially risk throwing the ball away, trying to be overamped, make too much of a play. So I, and again, that the reason I tweeted it the way that I did was just more of a form of a question. I didn't react and say, oh my gosh, Mason Wynn would have had the game should be over. I said, would he have, would Mason Wynn maybe have ended the game there? I'm not saying he would have, but it would have been intrigued. I would have been intrigued to see him try, I think is what I said. So let me know, Cardinals fans, do you think Mason would have been able to put it away? Uh, whereas Brandon Crawford pocketed it, which Ollie said that that was the right play. I think for Brandon Crawford, it certainly was the right play. For Mason Wynn, it would have been a dazzling manner in which to win a baseball game, but it also could have been a dazzling manner in which for the Cardinals to go 0-3 in, in the series and on the season if he if he does try and make the dazzling play and throws it away, which is not to say that from a skill perspective, I'd expect Mason Wynn to throw it away, but you know, even Arenado you know, botches a throw or botches a play defensively at times, and he's won like 10 gold gloves, so that that would have been a really tough spot for the Cardinals if it had gone that way. And so, you know, people don't like to give Ollie credit, but I say by doing nothing in that case, he he at least ensured that nothing crazy could have happened. But man, something crazy could have happened in a really good way. It would have been fun to see maybe Mason Wynn be able to be the guy to win the game there. But Gavin Lux, who's got some good speed too, is the other side of that. Ends up getting to first base. Mookie bets with the walk and then the, the pop out by Shohei Otani. And I tell you what, Gallegos... He's one of those guys that does. He's diligent about pointing to the pop-out. He used to kind of make fun and, and poke fun a little bit with uh, Henesis Cabrera that he would he would do the pitcher point up into the sky when there's a any ball in the air. It could be a 500-foot home run to dead center, and he would still point. Like, yeah, somebody's going to get that, right? It's, it's a ball in the air. But I say Gallegos on this one was pretty amped up to get that weak contact by Otani. He pointed immediately. Man, he looked like Craig Council in the batter's box back in the day with the, the, the tall point that he gave. I didn't confirm that Gio was on his tippy toes, but I think he was pretty excited and wanting to make sure somebody caught that ball, which Brandon Crawford did, but almost kind of didn't. He sort of ran around under it, and I get it. They were kind of in their galoshes out there with the way that the, the field was probably treated with all the rain and the, the torrential downpour that they got. But lo and behold, the Cardinals get the win. Oh, everybody could kind of exhale and breathe a little bit. I, I felt like after the Donovan double where they were up 5-2, it was like, oh, everybody could kind of unscrunch their shoulders and and the, the tightness in your neck can kind of go away. And obviously I was wrong about that because it ended up needing to be an extra inning game to win the game. But 
at least for the, like the first time, the Cardinals had a, not only a lead, but like a multi-run lead. They added on with insurance. Um, they ended up needing the insurance. Mookie Betts is just ridiculous. Another home run for him tonight. Um, Helsley, you know, you, you can take the good with the bad. Obviously, you don't want to see him give up a home run. The the base hits after that, you know, whatever. It's it's not ideal, and the timing certainly wasn't ideal. And he ends up, you know, giving up two runs, four hits, but had a couple of Ks, like still had some sharp stuff. He struck out Otani. It's not a good outing by Helsley. That's not what I'm saying. I I feel like people, when they want to be mad about something, it's like you can't possibly hear anything good said about the player that you're pissed off at, which is not reasonable or realistic. There are going to be goods and bads to, to all these outings for guys. Um, all in all, not a good outing by Helsley, but we saw some good things. Um, I, I think he'll bounce back and be just fine. Like, am I worried about Ryan Helsley? No, that's not a, a position that I take at this point. But I was impressed by Gio, his ability to battle. Helsley, you know, did get out of it. Like, could have ended the game right there in the ninth inning. Uh, didn't finish the inning. I think it was Teoscar Hernandez that he got to end the ninth. Couple of Ks, couple of Ks for Gio, as we mentioned. Um, JoJo ended up giving up that run in the seventh inning. So that was one of the runs given back, but he had two strikeouts too. Kittredge with a clean inning. It was good to see him get his debut. Cardinal pitching at 14 Ks. So uh, the offense struck out 14 times on Friday. Uh, the, the pitching staff was doing a nice job of missing bats on Saturday. The 14 strikeouts for the Cardinals. Helsley's home run given up to Mookie was the only one today. So that's an improvement compared to where they were with the, the four home runs given up on Friday and certainly a, a number of them given up on opening day. But the Cardinals get the win, 6-5. to five. Um, th There are no Pittsburgh Pirates who swept the Marlins. or I, I guess it's not a sweep. I guess they're probably still playing Sunday. But 3-0, the uh, Pirates over the Marlins. Jared Jones had 10 strikeouts today. He's a young pitcher. I actually don't know how young he is, but he's a relatively new pitcher for the uh, Pittsburgh. Yeah, he's 22. I think that's right. He's young. He looked good, though. I think he gave up a couple of runs, but 10 strikeouts. Paul Skeens. As well, ended up being pretty ridiculous for them in AAA. He's um he's going to be here soon. I think he's going to be here pretty soon. So, like, those Pirates, man, and I think it was, like, three perfect innings or something with five strikeouts for for uh, old Paul Skeens, a number, number two pick, number one pick. I can't remember. I think he was number one. Number two? Doesn't matter. The Pirates are somebody that, or a team that I am uh, kind of keeping my eye on. I think... What I tell you today, they're going to win the Central? Nah, probably not. Like, still think, you know, again, like I said, the Cardinals at the beginning of the year, I said, you know, 83, 82 wins. Cardinals could probably be enough. The The Pirates ha do have upside to win 90. Like, I don't know if the, the Cardinals, as constructed, can win 90 games. You know, they might need some real, real help at the deadline. Team that's a little bit above 500 gets some deadline help and then really could take off and, and maybe get there. I don't, I don't see it in their future. It's not something I would predict as of right now. Um, I don't really see that for the Cubs either. I think they're going to be a little bit too short on pitching. I think they they have enough talent, veterans, decent enough bullpen to get you to 80 wins. What do you do with the deadline? Uh, where do they end up from there? I don't think there's like huge upside to get the Cubs to 90. I think the Reds have the upside to get to 90 because if their young pitching can get healthy and can hit and their offense can, can vibe, they've got a lot of young position players that can take steps forward. Like, that's a range of outcomes. Uh, maybe it's only like a 6% chance, but I think that's, like, there's there's something in there that if the Reds hit, it could really, really hit. Whereas if the Cardinals hit, you're going, all right, solid, 86. They, they, they got it done this year. Reds, I think, have that kind of upside. Pirates might have that kind of upside, too. I'm not 100% sure that I'm comfortable with this take, but, like, Brian Hayes, I think, can be a dude and is, is really kind of coming along offensively. Already know he's a gold glove winner. Took it from Nolan last year. Um... Thinking about some of their other offensive players, Brian Reynolds is a stone-cold killer. Jack Sawinski can hit for power. Um, Henry Davis has come up. Like they've, they've got like half a lineup at least that I think could be really, really good, and then they maybe can piece it together from beyond that and, and see what they can do in the bullpen. They sign Chapman, et cetera. So uh, my parting words today, yes, the Cardinals won a game. It's good to see, and if they can, they can get the split on Sunday, I think we'll be singing a completely different tune compared to the one that we were singing after Friday's game where it's like, meh. Split with the Dodgers, the Earth's Mightiest Heroes. Maybe the, the season's not over after all. But, man, the Pirates are looking pretty good, at least early on. Those are my thoughts. Let me know yours in the YouTube comment section below. And make sure to hit that subscribe button in the lower right-hand corner of your screen.
YouTube.com slash at bshafer12. I am Brendan Schaefer. Cover the Cardinals for KMOV. And I do this podcast, Be Shafe Daily. Make sure to subscribe so that you can uh, stay tuned with it all year long as we cover and discuss the ins and outs of Cardinals baseball. Comment below your thoughts. How are you feeling about the Cardinals right now? And uh, we'll talk to you tomorrow, I'm sure. That's going to do it for this edition of the show. Appreciate you guys, as always. And we'll talk to you next time on Be Shafe Daily. Peace.